Welcome to everybody in our audience. We've got Manny Pacheco with us today. How are you doing, Manny Pacheco, today? I'm, I'm doing fine. Good. You're Manny. Voice, what happened to your voice? You've been going I through don't puberty know. there, John. <laughs> I've been I'm taking fine. I've been taking a formal voice, uh, uh, like uh, animation kind of stuff. Work, huh? Manny, uh, I want to talk about one of your favorite actors, mm -hmm. Humphrey Bogart. Oh, yeah. I didn't know. I didn't know that he had a wonderful stage career before he was in movies. That's true. And and also, let me just begin by saying uh, he's more than just my favorite. He was voted by the American Film Institute as the number one top actor in movie history. I mean, you really? Wow. Yes. Yeah. yes. Uh, number two was uh, Cary Grant. Number three, James Stewart. But yes, Humphrey Bogart comes in at number one. And so it's hard to argue with the popularity of this man of mystery. Uh, yes, he had a really iconic stage career. As a matter of fact, it's good that you mentioned that because it, it is his stage career that led to his uh, time in the movies because he just happened to fortuitously be on Broadway at the same time as Barbara Stanwyck and Spencer Tracy and Clark Gable and Betty Davis. And the movie moguls were in town because they had just began the opportunity to transition from silent movies to talkies. And they figured that many of the silent stars didn't have the voice uh, to transition well. And so they went across the country to Broadway and they discovered this new array of talent that included Humphrey Bogart. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, and so one of the first films that Humphrey Bogart made, and actually the first film of Spencer Tracy's, and the only time they collaborated together was in a John Ford film called Up the River hmm. in 1930. Yeah, wow. I mean, no one's ever heard of it. I've seen the movie. It's actually a crime comedy. This is before <laughs> this is before the Public Enemy and and uh, you know all of these great gangster films. Yeah. But let me just mention that uh, once uh, Humphrey Bogart settled at Warner Brothers, he wasn't the number one guy to go to. He wasn't the number two or number three or even the number four or number five guy to go to. The, in the pecking order, in the 1930s, the top talent were Edward G. Robinson, James Cagney, and uh, Errol Flynn. Wow. But that was followed by George Raft. So what happens is, is that Humphrey Bogart ends up to be the main heavy in many of these uh, uh, James Cagney or Errol Flynn or, or, Humph uh, or um, Edward G. Robinson films. And he ends up being the bad guy, the main bad guy who ends up uh, dying magnificently in each of these films. But it was very unfulfilling for, for, for Humphrey Bogart. So what, what, what catapulted him? Uh, was it a change of studios again? Was he loaned out? No. What happened? No, no, he stayed at Warner Brothers, but you know, that's a great question, Art. That's an absolutely magnificent question. A couple of things catapulted him, and one of them has to do with the fact that he was back on Broadway in a vehicle for, of all people, Leslie Howard. It was called The Petrified Forest, and uh, he gets to play this, uh, this gangster named Duke Mantee, and Leslie Howard was so enamored by Humphrey's performance that when they they sold the the rights to the to the property to Warner Brothers and Leslie Howard came along as the star they wanted to play him opposite Edward G Robinson and uh, and and Leslie Howard said no and then they offered George Rapp and Leslie Howard said no I won't do the picture unless Humphrey Go Bogart plays the the second lead and so that was such a defining moment for Humphrey Bogart that when Humphrey uh, Bogart had his first child, he named him Leslie. Hmm, really? And yeah. I, or is it maybe, maybe it's his daughter. It was his daughter, his second child. His second child was named Leslie. So, um, so a lifelong friendship until Leslie Howard, Howard died tragically in that, that plane that got shot down during World War II. Yeah. But Humphrey Bogart, that was his big break. Now, the people at Warner Brothers still wanted to typecast him, so he had to go another two or three years where he was typecast as the, the main heavy. But then they gave him the opportunity to play in a great film um, that takes place up in the uh, upper uh, parts of, uh, of the Sierra, Nevadas. And, it, and it's called High Sierra, opposite Ida Lupino, who gets top billing. 
And um, you got to play a villain with a lot of heart, with a lot of pathos. And that was the game changer. Hmm. And so, um, so the, the, the studio didn't take notice. But who did take notice was this up and coming director named John Houston. And when he was given his opportunity to finally direct a big, big movie, The Maltese Falcon, what did Warner Brothers do? They offered him James Cagney. <laughs> <laughs> they offered him George Rapp. And he said, no, I want Humphrey Bogart. Wow. And so Bogey did it, and then the rest is history. He never played second fiddle to anyone after, after that great performance in The Maltese Falcon. Wow. How soon, how soon after that did Casablanca? And African Queen show up. Uh, well, African Queen quite a bit later, but but uh, Casablanca came only a couple of years later. I think a couple of films in between. But he was starting to play now starring roles. I think he took second fiddle to Raymond Massey and across uh, the across uh, the Pacific. Um, but other than that, he was really now the star in all of his films, and and many of his films were going to be directed by by A listers like Howard Hawks and. Uh, and Michael Curtiz in, in Casablanca, and of course uh, John Huston did many of his films. You know, I, I've made no secret that Casablanca is my favorite film of all time, and of course I love the performance of Humphrey Bogart. But if you were to twist my arm and ask me what was the best, uh, maybe the best one or two Humphrey Bogart performances, I would have to say that at number two would be the Kane Mutiny, which he he was nominated for an Oscar, but number one and curiously not nominated, he was snubbed. I believe his greatest moment on screen was in The Treasure of the Sierra Madre. Mm. Oh, yeah. That's a great one. Oh, that absolutely. Yeah, but, that's my choice. I mean, how did, how did the, the whole uh, Bacall uh, thing uh, come about? With... That came, that came be because of a bet. <laughs> uh, Howard Hawks and, and Ernest Hemingway were friends, and Howard Hawks said, you know, Ernest, I could take your worst piece whatever you've written, the, the worst book you've ever written, and I could turn it into a magnificent film. So he gave him to have and have not. He redid the whole film. It doesn't even resemble the book. And, and they paired uh, Bogey and Bacall, and they fell in love right on screen. You can actually see the, the, the sparks between them. It, it, it happened, it happened uh, just by happenstance, but you get to witness it every time you watch the film. It's magnificent. And so um, here's, a, here's something I like to share with you. Many times we can talk about the great films. I mean, African Queen, of course, is his Oscar winning film in 51. But if you were to ask me, let's say, what are some films we should watch by Bogey that never, ever get mentioned? I would say at the top of that list is a great film. He did wonderful film noir with Elizabeth Scott, who is, I think, one of your favorites, John. Yeah. Um, Dead Reckoning. It came out in 1947. It is absolutely a great film, a lot of film noir. He kind of narrates the film and real sparks between him and Elizabeth Scott and a great storyline, real hard boiler, typical Warner Brothers type uh, a film. I would say that that's the film you should go watch if you haven't ever seen, uh, if you've seen them all, but there's one that's missing, that's the one you should watch. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, great actor. And uh, it's interesting that I was fascinated that he had had a Broadway, a very lucrative Broadway career mm -hmm. yes. uh, before the movies. I was surprised. And, and he was one of the very first actors, like Burt Lancaster, um, like Montgomery Clift, who actually went on his own. In, in the case of Burt Lancaster, Humphrey Bogart also formed his own company, uh, Santana uh, productions mm. uh, named after his boat, by the way, because he was a he was a seafaring man. He loved, and you'll notice that the films of the 1950s uh, are very different from those Warner Brothers films. I think only the Desperate Hours of, in 1955 resembles any of the films he did in the 40s. But I mean, you get some great films where you don't expect Bogey to play parts like in We're No Angels. He plays this loving convict during Christmas time. Sabrina, you don't expect him to be the one mm, who falls right. in. Right. The Hepburn, you know, and of course the African Queen, which is a comedy, and and playing off of the wonderful Catherine Hepburn. I mean, these are just some of the films that he did on his own. And while on his own, he was able again to work with John Huston because that he repaid the favor of John Huston choosing him. He then would choose John Huston on many occasions yeah. to go back and, and direct his films. Yeah, well, it's interesting. I'm not familiar 
not familiar with his uh, timeline, but you're right. There's a big difference between those later films. Yeah. Um, and when he could actually, I think, get roles that weren't one-dimensional bad guys. Right. And that's, that's a great way of putting it, uh, uh, John. It, it, he just hated playing those one-dimensional bad guys. He just yeah. did not like that at all. High Sierra, he got to play yeah. a bad guy with a heart, and that was the game changer. Then right. people saw the mystique. Now, his last film, I think this is a good point, uh, it, it, he was very ill at that time. He had lung cancer. He could barely talk and still delivers, I think, a really magnificent performance. And it's called The Harder They Fall, really tough tough film about the uh, boxing racket and instead of playing the bad guy the bad guy in this movie happens to be rod steiger a really wonderful role uh but but he plays the uh, the, the the i guess he's the press guy he's the press agent who happens to be a writer who's kind of going along with the bad guy for a for a for a moment and then he decides to help out the boxer who's going to get cheated at the very end uh, and and he turns out he turns in a t -t -t turns out to be a hero, and with the help of his wife, played by Jan Sterling, the magnificent underrated Jan Sterling, who was in The High and the Mighty and a few other films. He was she was also an ace in the hole. But Jan Sterling plays his wife, and it's it, it, they have a real tender relationship. And he and he turns out to be a really good guy in this when he could have easily have played the Rod Steiger part, but. Uh, no, I, I think he went out with, I think, a strong film. Now, granted, it's not Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, last film with Spencer Tracy good, but right. it's still very solid, a very good performance, and a great way to end his career. Well, even even if you really like that side of, of the man, we'll always have Duke Man T. <laughs> and we'll always have Paris. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 uh, I'm sort of, uh, the breadth of things that I didn't know, uh, which you, of course, do, Manny, but, uh, but sometimes you overwhelmingly surprised with bits and pieces, like I knew Cagney and many of the others who went from Broadway to, um, uh, to, uh, to movies. I didn't realize that he had that in his background, but if somebody wanted to, I, where do you go if you wanted to binge watch? Like if you have three or four days and you want to binge watch Bogey from A to Z, where would you do that? It would, it would take a solid week as far as I'm concerned, maybe longer. Uh, you know, they did a they did a whole um, month of Humphrey Bogart, two days in a row uh, on TCM recently. And let me tell you, that was must-see TV for me. I mean, it was just fun to watch many of the movies that I love to watch. But then they would throw in something from the 1930s that I was just I had forgotten about. That was just really good and fun to watch. And, uh, it, it, you know, a lot of Humphrey Bogart stuff is available out there. So, I mean, it's easy to find him because he's so popular and so iconic. They've, they've made movies about him, played against Sam with, uh, with Woody Allen. They've done music about him, the, 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 the song Key Largo by Bertie Higgins. Mm. And remember the year of the cat mentions Humphrey Bogart, Al Stewart's song. So even as late as the 1970s, they were really celebrating the mystique of Humphrey Bogart. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, this has been- And this I'm has sure been a, that will continue yeah. as long as there is film. Right. That's it. As long as we have money to pick us up and shake us and say, this is, you didn't know about this guy. You didn't know about this gal. So thank you, Manny. And uh, I'm, I, I'm going to, I have to, since I can handle the controls here, I'm going to go find myself a bogey movie. What was that first one he was in? Uh, up the River, 19, uh, 1930. Okay, well, uh, as soon as we get off the air, I'm going up the river. Thank you, Manny. <laughs> Well, here's looking at you, kids. Oh. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.